We still want to come, uh, for all these critical questions and these challenges, we still want to understand democracy. Because I think most of us, even when we see the warts and the flaws, we still believe in it because, as the quip often goes, democracy is a horrible system. It's just the least horrible of all the other systems of trying to concoct a governance. All right, so we, we still want to understand democracy. I talked earlier about the difference between conceptions of democracy that I put under the heading of popular democracy and those that come under the heading of managerial democracy. I want to take that basic idea and push it a little more. We could talk about democracy as, again, a system of participation. That what defines democracy is the degree of participation. That would track on to the popular democracy category that we talked about and the theorists that I quoted. And then there's a, another way to think about democracy as really a system of ratification. That tracks with the managerial democracy. When we say democracy is participation, that's clear. We mean people participating. When we say democracy is ratification, what we mean is that in this complex society, most people are not going to participate. What they're going to do is ratify either a set of programs or a set of politicians or a set of experts. They're going to ratify choices made by others. That when you go to vote, you're not really shaping the world. You're ratifying the vision of some others who are shaping the world. So this tension between democracy as participation, democracy as ratification, has been going on, as I said, for a long, long time. We talked about it most specifically in the context of the 20th century in the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to add a third idea, that that long-standing struggle between popular and managerial, between democracy as participation and democracy as ratification, what if those are, in a sense, moot points? What if that doesn't matter anymore? What if, in fact, we've moved to a, a place in the world where democracy is just consumption? You don't actually, you certainly don't participate. You don't even really ratify. What you do is you consume politics like you consume products. That politics is now nothing more than one more branded product in your culture. What if, in fact, the, the, the dream of popular democracy we've had to leave behind for ratification. But what if the system really isn't even a meaningful system of ratification anymore, it's just spectacle? Think about it. You might think, well, that's ridiculous. But I may have mentioned this before, but the, lead, the, the uh, advertising campaign that won several advertising awards in 2008 for the best campaign. The best advertising campaign in America was the Obama presidential campaign. When the advertisers are looking at the political world and saying, damn, they're good. The advertisers, the people who spend their entire day trying to get you to buy more stuff that you don't need. That's what advertisers do for the most part, yes? More stuff that you don't need. Those sneakers, you really need a new pair. Of, you know, do you want to be a loser? Now, let me forget it. You're stuck. You're a loser. Okay, you, but you, now, those are nice, but you need some new sneakers because they have better sneakers and they're more popular than you. Right. That's what advertising does, yes? We know that. I mean, even if we sometimes are, are sucked into it, we know that's what advertising is doing. We know advertising is playing on our fear. Our fear of not being good enough, not being popular enough, not being pretty enough. My favorite are the shampoo commercials. Right? You know the shampoo commercials? You know what happens if you use the right shampoo. I don't really have the hair to do the demonstration anymore, but you know, that whipping your hair around, you, you're putting the shampoo. Oh my God, this is so beautiful. I'm going to be beautiful and popular. Oh, because I am using this shampoo, which is chemically indistinguishable from every other goddamn shampoo you can buy. But it's going to make me popular. I mean, you know, come on. I mean, do you, 
Maybe we get sucked into it, but does anybody take that seriously? No, but we know that it's powerful. Okay, what if politics is becoming another kind of consumption? Have we, have we reached a point where people's main relationship to the political world is not that different than the relationship we have to the, the consumer world? You know, that we define ourselves by what we buy. I bought Obama, you bought McCain. Is that, is that how it's going? These are critical questions, and I want to make, again, the point. They are nonpartisan questions. I don't think the answer to this question implicitly favors one or the other of the main political groupings in the United States. This is a critique of the system, and again, a system that we're going to want to return to when we talk about journalism. So if democracy can be thought of as either participation, ratification, or consumption, then we have to ask, well, who are we in that system? <coughs> Excuse me. Are we participants in, in a conception of democracy as participation? Then we are serious participants in democracy. If democracy is nothing more than ratification, then we're kind of spectators. We just sit back and watch and make choices. But if politics and democracy has become consumption, then we're nothing more than consumers. And I think most people realize that when you are living in the mode of a consumer, there's something inadequate about that. If you spent your whole life in nothing but consumption mode, how would you feel at the end of the day? Would that feel authentic? Would that feel much like being a citizen as part of a democratic system? It's an interesting set of questions. So, when I reach the limits, hold on one second. <coughs> Excuse me. When I reach the limits of my own capacity, we didn't get to that one, to articulate difficult philosophical issues, what do I do? Where do I always go? Yeah, yeah. It's, when, you, when you bump up against the limits of your own intellectual abilities, as I do quite often, I always go to Michael Franti. So, this, this, there's a, a message in this song that's relevant to what we're talking about here. So, let's rest my voice and listen to the words and enjoy the music of this song. Critiques of the way that politics has become a form of consumption. You'll hear people hearkening back to a notion of citizenship. And it's very common to hear people say, we have to resist just being consumers and, and seize citizenship again. We've got to take sort of back the notion of being citizens. Right. Now the question is why? Why would we want to do that? And I think that the refrain in this song is my answer. It's not just about being a citizen in a democracy. That's not the end state. That's not the goal. The goal is to be a human being. So when he sings, I'm a human being, that assertion over and over again, I'm a human being, it may seem trivial. Well, of course you're a human being. You are in the species Homo sapiens. What else are you? You're not a rat. You're not a yes, you're a human being. But of course, that's not what we mean when we assert our status as human beings. We're asking a complex question, maybe the most complex question in all of philosophy, what does it mean to be a human being? We are not rats and wolves. We have a capacity for critical self-reflection that, to the best of our understanding, no other animal species has. Other species, especially the higher order primates, they're a lot like us in certain ways, but to the best of our understanding, no other species has this ability to ask, who are we? What does it mean to be human? We also have a complex linguistic capacity to articulate this over and over again. And we do it. We, we search for this in philosophy. We do it in poetry and art and song. This constant quest to understand what it means to be a human being, and that struggle to understand that, it strikes me, is what's really important here. 
The goal is not citizenship for the sake of citizenship. It's citizenship so that we can take control of what we understand it to be, to mean to be human. And that may, that, let that settle in. It may seem almost trivial or kind of silly, but I think it is the most profound question we have in front of us. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean for myself? What's my obligation to myself? If I understand myself as human, what does that mean for me? What does it mean for my relationship to others? What does it mean for my relationship to that larger living world? If I think that to be human simply means to maximize my own self-interest, then there are certain answers that will follow from that. If I think being human means something else, then other answers will follow. And I think, in the end, <coughs> I really apologize for this. Uh, cold. Oh, hold on. That if I were to offer my own definition of democracy, which is going to be very straightforward, and clearly showing my own commitment to the popular form of democracy. If we were to define democracy simply as in this way, a system is democratic to the degree that ordinary people have a meaningful role in the formation of public policy. Right. Notice a couple of things about that definition. It doesn't say a democracy is. It doesn't lead to a yes or no answer to the question of is society A a democracy? It's it says a system is democratic to the degree, we're talking about degrees of democracy, that it's difficult to achieve a truly, in any organization, you know, over four people, it gets very hard to have an authentic democracy in every possible sense of the word. So in the large complex societies we're talking about, a system is democratic to the degree that ordinary people have a meaningful role in the formation of public policy. This is what I've been nibbling around the edges of the last three weeks. This is what, after a lot of time thinking about this, is how I define democracy. Ordinary people, again, to reinforce this, not simply elites, not simply people with advanced education, not simply people who have achieved a certain prominence, but ordinary people. There's a commitment in this definition of democracy to the belief that every person has the capacity to participate. Yes, some people are smarter than others. Yes, some people are better at spinning an argument than others. People have different talents, different temperaments. Not everybody contributes the same way. But underneath this notion is the belief that every single person has the capacity to be part of a democratic system, contributing something to that process. That's the first part of this. The second part is the formation of public policy, that ordinary people have a meaningful role in the formation of public policy. That means not simply a role in ratifying or purchasing a politics, but a role in forming that politics, having a role in articulating what the nature of the problems might be, have a role in sorting through the possible responses to a problem, and then finally making a decision about what the best solution might be. That final step in the process, deciding which policy you want to go forward, which tax structure, which way of organizing the school system, that final decision about which one you support. Do you support this proposal or that proposal? That's not the most important, necessarily, you have to go back and ask, well, I'm being asked to choose between A or B, but did I, I have a role in deciding what the range of proposals would be? And then you can go back one more step and say, did I have a role in identifying what I believe the, the major problems to be that we're going to then solve? So a deep democracy, a democracy in which ordinary people are really participating, is not simply a system in which you participate by selecting between policies. It's not even a system where you have input into the nature of the policies. It's a system in which you have a role 
in deciding what are the problems that need to be addressed. Okay. Now ask yourselves, how many of you feel like you have a meaningful role in identifying the nature of the problems that are most important in society today? Well, somebody in the back, okay. Most of you don't. Most people would say they probably don't. Do you have a role in defining what the relevant options are? Do you even have a role in selecting which of those options? Well, I, I'm not suggesting there's an obvious answer to this, and people will disagree. But that's the place I want to get in this discussion of democracy. Recognizing that the system in which we live is democratic to a degree. That all the things we've been talking about are not trivial. The, the question of, <coughs> excuse me, the question of a system of freedom of expression in which you're allowed to communicate with others relatively freely, that's important. A system of freedom of political association in which you're allowed to gather with others and organize yourselves, that's important. Free, fair, open, contested, all of that's important, but those are vehicles to something, not ends in themselves from my point of view. And so the question is, what are we trying to get at? And I think we're trying to get at this because this is how you figure out what it means to be a human being. It's wrestling with all of this that helps you come to understand who you are who you are in relationship to yourself, to others, and to that larger living world. And that if all you do is sort of skate on the surface of decisions, choices, and struggles that others have engaged in, you will never know yourself as a human being. You will never really understand yourself because that understanding of self comes through that engagement and that struggle. And so I'm making, I'm trying to, to end my pitch to you here by making an argument that democracy is crucial for the reasons that we understand and that we talk about all the time. The institutions in democracy that we want to always make better are important, but that the reason that we struggle to achieve democratic societies is in fact this important. It's how we come to understand ourselves and that in systems where you do not have the capacity to participate it's much harder to do that, much harder to understand yourself and understand what it means to be a human being. It doesn't mean that in other systems people never do. People struggle. But if you think about the struggles in authoritarian systems in which people understand themselves, it's usually in the struggle against that authority. So I, I read poems from Faiz, the, the Pakistani poet. And you might say, well, he didn't really ever live in a very meaningful democracy, but he explored what it meant to be human. He did. But he did that because he was constantly striving in democratic fashion to engage and to transform the society in, he which, in which he lived. So I'm making the argument that when we live in truly democratic systems, we have the capacity to explore and, in fact, by struggling to achieve those democratic systems, we practice that capacity to understand ourselves more fully. And that matters. That really does matter. Especially in the culture in which we live, in which a definition of yourself through the market, through the mall, is waiting there for you. If you want to decide who you are by going to the mall, there will be an answer there, yes? You go to the clothing store, you go to the shoe store, you go to the, the, the video games, whatever it is that you use to define. All of that's out there. And the question is, is that how you really understand yourselves? So I'm taking this discussion we have about democracy and trying to push it a bit further to try to suggest to you it's, it's not just boring political science stuff. It's actually about what it means to be a human being. And if you don't believe me, you can at least believe Michael Franti. He's a lot hipper than I am. <laughs>